Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Dane here, and I'm here with a wonderful and amazing person. Her name is Terry Hope, and we're talking about the research project she has recently completed on Access Consciousness Mars. Terry, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, how are you, Dane? Thanks. So great to see you. Oh, it's great to be here with you, and I'm excited. You know, it's like in having done these bars myself for 18 years and seeing the changes they create like nothing else on the planet, so nice to get the scientific perspective of, well, of a lot of things of, hey, this is actually happening, but also, you know, the extent to which it is, but also with the brain mapping, which we're going to get into, um, how you're actually able to scientifically acknowledge what's occurring. Yeah, it was really cool. And you know what's so interesting, Dane, is that I kind of looked at it and went, how is it possible that by touching points on the head, this much change could occur in such a short period of time? Like it blew my mind. <laughs> You know, I, I sometimes think that, you know, like a hammer upside the head might create change instantaneously too, but that doesn't seem to be a viable option in most people's worlds. <laughs> so can you talk a little, before we get started into the project itself, can you talk a little bit about your background and your story and, you know, what your credentials are, how you got here, that sort of thing? Um, so I'm a PhD and doctor of natural medicine. My specialty is in quantum um, medicine. So which the premise of which is everything is energy. And I truly believe that the fabric of the universe is coming from energy, um, really at some level. And um, the beginning of my journey was actually in 2013. I was um, at a, actually at an access class and I went, hmm it would be really cool to do a study on access bars and anxiety and depression. So I kind of spurred on I, and I, I just kept on and going and thinking I've got to find a way to do that. And in fact, um, this would be the second piece of research that I've been able to participate in on access bars. One of which I did with Dr. Fan and which hasn't yet been published. Um, however, there's some really great results that coincide with the results of this research as well. Cool. Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about the value of, of research studies as far as they relate to bars? Like, you know, what, what does that give us? What's, what's the gift in that? Well, I think that the gift is that for some people who need to hear it, there's those of us who know, or those of people who have experienced um, access bars and have really received a lot of um, change or something different in their life or are happier. They know by experience that that, can occur. And then there's other people who really need to know, you know, give me something tangible so I can really be able to see it or hear it or know that it's going to work or that there's something there. And, yeah. and I th think that the more people who are doing things around energy work or energy medicine or, and including access bars will allow people to really see that that's a way that they can also have change for themselves regardless of whether it's for health or for happiness or whatever. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I think you said it yourself. You're like, I was so surprised that touching somebody's head could have these amazing changes, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so easy. It's so simple to learn and so available. People often discount it and go, Oh, well, of course that could work, you know, or, or unless, and the, I would say it falls into two camps. There's that, and then there's the other side of those of us who have had it where we're like, <laughs> it works. I have no idea how, but it definitely works. So, so can you actually, can we talk about the study and, uh, you know, what you found as it relates to bars and depression and anxiety? Okay. So this study was um, considered a pilot study because of the number of people that were in the research. So it started off with 10 people and the final number were seven, um, both men and women equally um, in equal groups. And the criteria to be in the study was that they had to either be depressed or have anxiety or both. And 50% of people who have any kind of um, disorder, a mood disorder, often have um, coexisting anxiety. So what was interesting when we looked at the results, one of the things I looked at was, do they have, what kind of anxiety do they have? Or what kind of depression do they have? So there was one test that we looked at, which was 
do they have what's called state anxiety, which is a kind that's temporary and often goes, or something called trait character anxiety, which is something that's long lasting and part of their sort of how they are as a being, let's say. Mm. Um, and we did the same for depression. And what was really fascinating was all seven people who I didn't know any of these people to begin with, they were new to me, they hadn't even heard about, most of them hadn't even heard about what energy was. Um, all seven had what's called trait anxiety, which wow. the whole life was really, you know, that was their operating system, basically. Whoa, wow. I, I didn't know that piece of the information. You just brought me to tears on that one. I mean, because, you know, I, I obviously know the results of the study, too. Wow, that these yeah. people had had this you know, it's called trait anxiety for a reason. It's one of their, you know, the traits they're expressing in their world constantly. Wow. So. Yeah. And two had, would be considered having uh, trait depression. So um, it was quite interesting to have that kind of thing show up for a piece of research with, you know, that few people. Wow. Yeah. So can you, can you, or is this the point at which we cut to the chase and tell them what we found in the research? Uh, we could do that. Okay. okay angling a little longer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, there were four tests. Um, the ones that were most remarkable, so I did four tests, two for anxiety and two for depression. Um, part of the reason you would do that is to double look at, you know, the results, the questionnaires were different for each one of them. And for the um, Beck anxiety uh, inventory, which is a standardized test method, psychological testing method, the results had an 84% 84.7% change in the mean or the average change for the between the pre-score and the post-score for anxiety. Wow. An so eighty-four point seven, an eighty. Let's call it eighty-five. An eighty-five percent change. That's right, and the and the range was anywhere from a hundred percent to like something like fifty-three percent. So that's how you wow. get that score so some people like one of the people had a hundred percent change wow yeah. and, and then when you, have, when you have something like that i mean when you have somebody who comes in they get their bars run for how long was the session oh okay sorry the uh the session was one session and it was 90 minutes long okay so this is based so this is one bar session 90 minutes long and these people are self-reporting 85 percent uh, an average let's say of 85 percent change so that's at correct. least and the lowest person was 53%. That's right. And the highest oh. was 100%. Man, God, the gift. <laughs> I'm probably not supposed to cry in this video, but man, this, this is why we do what we do. I mean, this is just, oh my, oh my God, God, the fact that, I mean, a 50% change. And most of these people have probably been trying everything under the sun to get some sort of change. And the fact that you said, you know, they had no idea what energy was, you hadn't met them before, that... Oh also for me validates that it is about the bars and it's not, you know, people coming and going, Oh, I, you know, people that have never heard of it. No. And it was quite remarkable. And, um, the same kinds of results were seen in the other tests. So the Beck depression inventory, which I use for, um, one of the depression scales had an 82.7% change as a, as an average score. Wow. So they really reflected the same. And what was also interesting, Dane, is that, um, the people who were in the study, they actually all had like a pretty um, broad distribution between mild to severe. So when it came to anxiety, like they, there was like at least one or two people in the severe category and then a couple in the moderate category and then, you know, um, the rest were in the mild category. So it was really broadly distributed across. Right. And, yeah. So that was really interesting because we got a really great mix. Wow. Well, and I mean, if it's like, and but I look at that, you know, having looked at many studies myself for different reasons, especially going through chiropractic school and, and seeing the efficacy of different methods. And then when I was researching depression myself, when I had it before bars, trying to find something that actually worked was practically non-existent because no matter what I tried, it never created a 50% result, especially in an hour and a half, you yeah. know, and, and the average being 85% for people who have this once again is, as one of their fundamental traits. So this is amazing. So, yeah, so cool. one of the, one of the things that we spoke about before, you know, before we 
started recording was the brain mapping that you did and, and how that creates a validity for, for the research in itself. And I know on a, a recent video that you did with some, you know, explaining this, there was one lady who was just not nice. You know, she was trying to show how what you did was invalid or show how this study must have been designed incorrectly. And you went with her point by point and point and showed her what you did. And at the end of it, she was like, oh, wow, uh, uh, this is valid, you know, because she was a researcher herself. Um, and so can you, can you talk about, about the validity of the research number one or the organization of it and how it actually is valid and also how doing the brain mapping and getting the, the um, brainwave studies actually, what it is number one and then how that creates the validity in the study. Okay, I can do that. So when we look at the questionnaires, um, when we take all the questionnaires together, if we're just like not to take them one by one, the, um, in general, the chance of these results um, in the questionnaires um, had a 3% or less than 3% chance of happening by chance. In fact, the one on the Beck Anxiety Inventory had a 99.6% chance of not ever having, being able to happen by chance, so point wow. four. So when you look at those kinds of things statistically, and all of the data was actually measured for validity before it went into statistical um, computation. So you can't say like, because on a small number of people, you'd have to like look and see whether it was relevant. So it was, and it went through all the statistical stuff and, and the results were astounding. So basically you could say that 97% couldn't, it couldn't have occurred by chance. Right. So, right. Yeah, which is fabulous. Cool. And then when I took it, so the next thing I did was I, so I did all these questionnaires and then I did what's called um, brain mapping or quantitative electroencephalogram. So we put a, a cap on the head and measured the brainwave patterns before and after we did, um, I did the bars. And um, it's a standardized scientific testing method. And what we found with that was really interesting in that there was a large, all of the people in the study had depressed energy in certain frequencies. So the depressed energy was um, in theta through beta, if you want to get, I can get more technical, but I won't. And please, please don't. <laughs> okay. So I what, love it. I don't think, I don't think most people do, unfortunately. <laughs> what was, what was interesting, Jane? I mean, I won't go technical, but what was interesting is some of it was highly depressed energy in scientific terms, as big as three standard deviations below the norm. Oh. Now, at the end of it, it was normal. Wow. <laughs> Most of the people. Generally speaking, you would have to do, if you were doing, let's say, neurofeedback to change your brain and you had those kinds of things going on, you could do maybe 20 sessions, as many as 20 sessions to get that kind of change to occur. Like that's wow. how astounding it was. And um, so that was really interesting. And then when you look at um, those kinds of frequencies and you look at some of the data that was produced and it said, okay, some research studies have shown if you increase the frequencies or the um, energy in certain frequencies in people who have trade anxiety, then it will actually get them out of trade anxiety. And that's exactly what showed up in the research. Wow. The same thing with depression. It was also reflected where if you increase beta activity um, for people who have depression, you will, they will have less depression. And that was totally reflected in those frequencies. So that's why that part, without getting scientific about it, was really interesting. Wow, really. that's amazing. I feel like my job is to just sit here and say, wow. And I, I don't, don't really have another word other than, oh my God. How friggin' awesome, you know, that, I mean, wow, that, that, and I gotta say, it's like, it, for me, you know, it literally, access literally saved my life 18 years ago. Actually, getting a bar session literally saved my life 18 years ago. And I was depressed and I was with anxiety and it had become a trait, you know, it had become a trait over the last three years. And I'm sure it was probably still state anxiety and depression, but it literally changed like that and I never contemplated killing myself again. So when you're presenting these 
these numbers to those of us that have used this stuff, we look and go, well, that makes total sense. And at the same time, to to get the sheer the 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 sheer magnitude of the change that people get and the numbers of people for whom it occurs, the percentage of people for whom it occurs, absolutely phenomenal. This is friggin' awesome. I'm excited. Yeah, and it's interesting you should, well, um, the thing about people killing themselves, which we know that's something that's really prevalent. Um, one of the people in the research, after I was doing the tabulation of all the results, I looked at this one particular person who actually was suicidal. And she rated really off the scale when it came to anxiety and depression. And her results at the end of it had zero as a score for suicide. <laughs> Which is like, that was such a, that was such a surprise. I had no idea. I mean, she was looking like a functioning human being when she walked in the door. Oh, but, uh, wow. Really well. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It was so, that was me. Is, wow. To say wow. Yeah. Uh, so, whoa, can, can you, um, as we wrap up here, can you talk about the coherence? Because that's one of the other things that you spotted and, other, and one of the other things that, that seems to be so dynamic in what this changes, you know, I have my own take on what coherence would be like and, but can you talk about what you found with coherence and what that might relate to in sort of plain English for people? Okay, I can do that. So um, all of the people in the study had um, an increase in brain coherence. And that can be a difficult, a really technical subject. But in this case, what when we looked at brain mapping, a lot of them had what's called hypocoherence, which means that their brain is not communicating as well as it could between regions, which mm. sometimes you see in things like dyslexia, traumatic brain injury can sometimes show up that way. And what it did was it moved towards normal um, in all of the subjects and the statistical relevance of that was really high as well. So um, that was fabulous. And so what that means for people, um, when you're functioning from place of um, optimal coherence or then what happens is you can think better, you can be more creative, you could have, they've looked at coherence in terms of increasing scores, intelligence, um, Wow. All kinds of things where if you went from an underfunctioning brain that isn't communicating very well to one that's actually communicating well after a 90 minute bar session, that was to me, that was phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. I did, you know, I, I studied some other work where they were, you know, it was about helping your brain and that sort of thing. And, and, mm -hmm. and it was interesting because I did it and I, you know, went through this, I don't know what it was, it was like an hour long thing, you know, where you try it out and whatever. And I went through an hour long thing and it was interesting because for me, I felt like I had had like a 10th of a bar session or a 20th of a bar session, or I don't know how to describe it, but it was like, oh, that basically was like almost not even beginning to have a bar session. You know what I mean? For, for that level of, of what it felt the, cause that coherence for me, it, it, like you said, you know, for me energetically or the way I sense it is it feels like everything's connected and working, but also the sense it gives me is sort of this connection with everything out here is connected and working too. And I'm connected to it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and well, at least that's what I get from bars. I don't know what realm of the spectrum that, you know, that speaks to, but it was, it's interesting. To, I mean, Wow, those results to... The coolness wow. that you're talking about feeling connected. So all of the people in the research had this thing at this particular frequency, which is 22 hertz, right on the top of their head. It showed up in their brain map. All of them <laughs> as, being, as being highly active, which is usually about high engagement, like that particular um, frequency is about integrating new information and um yeah high activation wow so it would might be could mean anything <laughs> that is so cool and i mean so if guys out there if you watch the video this far obviously there's something about this that is speaking to you um i'm really excited because i've been doing this 18 years teaching it to people for 18 years there are literally millions of people around the world doing this right now 
And I've been fortunate to meet hundreds of thousands of them in the 18 years I've been doing it since I got my life saved 18 years ago, but never having any research. I just knew that it did something that contributed to people. And with Terry coming along and showing us that, look, there's actually something happening that is, that is not only, one of the things I love about it is it's actually reproducible and you know, it's reproducible. And this is not something where, oh, you must become a bar's master. And once you become a bar's master, then you can give this gift to others. This is like, hi, I'm Bob. I don't know what the fuck energy is, but guess what? Um, I want to learn this. And you put your hands on people and shit changes. You know, it's like, it ain't brain surgery. So I just wanted to make that point in case people are sitting and going, oh, well, they have a study, so it must be scientific and you must be a master. And no, man, this is for all of us. This is a tool that's available for all of us. One of the things I'm excited about, Terry, is the possibility of studying traumatic brain injury, PTSD, because we've seen it in with people who come and do this work, especially PTSD. I mean, the stories that I could tell you, the hundreds of people that I've seen that totally eliminated PTSD from their lives using bars and other access consciousness tools is off the charts. So I'm, I'm really excited for, for what is possible ahead. Oh yeah. So I'm already starting to write the next two pieces of research. And one of them includes, <laughs> includes um, that subject for sure. And probably a larger study, um, longer term on anxiety and depression and uh, the addition of stress and pain within that study, which will make it really interesting to see what the effects are on that. So awesome. I am very much looking forward to that. And Terry, thank you so much for being with me today and making, thank you for, for having the balls to go do this. I, that may seem inappropriate to say to a beautiful woman, but thank you for having the balls to go do this and, and the, the willingness to actually put it in this framework that everybody out there in the world can understand. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and everybody out there, uh, you can go to accessconsciousness.com to find out more. You can go to, what is our bars website? Accessconsciousnessbars.com. Access the bars. Bars. Access the bars.com. See, I don't go to the bars website very often because I already know all the people who run the bars. So, access the bars.com. Go there and you can find a bars practitioner. You can find a bars, uh, a bars practitioner to get your bars run. You can find a bars facilitator if you want to take a bars class and learn how to do this. And get this, guys. The class is one day long. And it really is something yeah. where you learn this and you can do it for people after that one day. We wanted to make it easy and hopefully we have. So thank you all so very much for watching. Terry, thanks again. And we'll see you all soon. Bye.